this, as Marjorie tells me, is the first day of winter, so we're into our winter scenario of this whole series that we're doing, and uh, spring will be coming up shortly, we hope, and uh, we'll be down, probably down the river again. Anyway, today, to continue with the series, I'm going to look at a number of other kinds of books that Rod has written and make some comments on them. And to start with, though, I think just a quick picture of Rod himself in black and white, and then also one in Anne in black and white. So, let's begin um, with something that I, w I think should be included in this series, someone who was a very good friend of, of Rod's, and that was Van Egan. And uh, Van Egan actually was the uh, first Hague Brown, did the first Hague Brown Memorial Lecture. These, by the way, are the chat books that are done at the Hague Brown Memorial Lectures that were started in, in 2009. Here's Van's quote. I met the Hague Browns in 1954. I was on Vancouver Island for a week only in early July and had the audacity to go to the house and ask Rod to sign my copy of The Western Ang Angler. He was very gracious. That was one of his great strengths, making you feel completely comfortable even though you were a complete stranger who had stopped at his house. And they became lifelong friends. Van had come from Wisconsin where he was, was also fishing there and he's a, an, an accomplished um, author, fortunately, still not alive, unfortunately. So that's a nice quote, I think, to start this series. For, and then I wanted to just to move into things that were sort of winterish. And this one is Starbuck Valley Winter, and I read this when I was a teenager, and I just wished so much that I could be the, yeah, the star in this particular book. Uh, interestingly enough, in terms of notes, it, um, the second American edition of this book was the biggest selling books and it sold 80,000 copies between 1949 and 1956. And it was written, as I said, in 1943. The, the scene is a, a young fellow called Don who was 16 or 17. Rod was 17 when he came to, into this area, into Campbell River area, and, and the Nimkish worked in logging. Uh, and what he wanted to do was earn enough money trapping to be able to buy a boat called the Mallard. And the Mallard morphed into another book, again, by, of course, by Rod. This one he wrote in 1948, and it was called Saltwater Summer, and that's the Mallard. Well, it ended up being called the Falaise, but that was the Mallard that Don was able to buy as a result of trapping. And I think, I guess it was because I lived in Wells when I was a, near Barkerville, and I was about between around 14 or 16 that I sort of tuned into all of these things. So, um, this is, again, it's, well, it is part of the winter series because Don, who was skippering the, the uh, you know, the, the um, fallets or saltwater summer kind of thing, the, the Mallard said that he wanted to go fishing in the wintertime, and he and his friend, Tubby, were uh, very good friends. And there's a, a part of a story in here that I think is worth, worth reading. Uh, he, and, he and Tubby decided they're going to go into the woods and they're going to build a shelter and they're going to trap and they're going to get enough animals and skins to be able to buy the boat. So this is a, a classic way that Rod wrote, I think, because it's quite, quite gripping. Tubby was not in the cabin and there was no fire in the stove or fireplace. Don was returning from trapping. Don threw his pack sack down, leaned his rifle and axe against the wall and went out again. Tubby had the rafters of the woodshed in place and had already started by laying, by laying shakes. Don called again and waited, called again and felt suddenly scared and lonely. It wasn't like Tubby to go off anywhere so near dark. Don shouted again from the doorway of the cabin, then went to the back of the cabin and shouted again. The woods were empty and silent and it was almost dark now. He looked at the half-built woodshed, trying to judge what Tubby, Tubby would have planned to do. Two poles were cut to brace the side wall, lying alongside the uprights. There were none yet for the end wall. Don looked quickly around for Tubby's axe. It wasn't there, and he hadn't seen it with the saw and the fro up by the cedar. Some of you will remember a fro if you've ever split shakes. 
He began to run down the hill towards a patch of small growth from which they had always cut their poles. He could see the white chips and fresh stumps of Tubby's cutting, and he called again, then saw Tubby's shape, dark and indistinct, on the ground a few yards away from him in the thicket. Tubby was lying on his back, his eyes closed tight, his face white in the dusk. Don saw the bright head of the axe lying by his side and thought of the cleated footprint on the trail on the hill above the meadows. There was no mark on head or face, only that drawn paleness. He opened the coat and could feel the heart beating. Then he saw the great cut in the shoe and the sticky blackness of the blood all around it, on the leather and on the soap needle covered ground. And then he goes on to how what happens with Tubby. So I, it's interesting, I guess, these days, calling someone Tubby wouldn't really be politically correct or sensitively correct, but th th there's a reason for that in this case. So it goes on with that part of it. And um, I don't know whether this would be interesting for teenagers this time to leave when you could get it on, you know, you could probably tune into it on your on your cell phone or your your iPad or whatever. But anyway, that's Starbuck Valley Winter. Um, Saltwater Summer, as I mentioned, is a, a sequel to that a few years later. And since it's December time, I thought, well, there's a chapter here in, in December in The River Never Sleeps. And this is a delightful book. It was written again in 1946, and he does all of the seasons um, of the river. In the inside flap, it says, Month by month, from January, searching for steelhead in the dark, cold water to May, and the sea run cutthroats to the October run of spawning salmon, he takes you from the river to river down to the last salt water and the sea. And this is the, the writer um, who was reviewing it. And let's see, we've got another interesting spot here too. And again, this is, this is December with a nice black and white print by Charles Lafayette, who does a lovely illustrations. And I think it's by Charles, yes. Um, for the fly fishermen on the Pacific coast, December is the beginning rather than the end of the year. In November, even the most enthusiastic fly fisherman may decide to lay his rods aside, dry off his lines, and tie up some flies against a new season. Then in December, with the running of the first winter steelheads, the new season starts. In November, the salmon die by hundreds and by thousands on the shallow bars in the eddies under the sweepers along the banks. This whole writing here is, is, a, when I'm, is an illustration of Rod's in-depth understanding of eggs and spawning and alevins and everything else. In December, salmon are living again, millions upon millions, where only thousands died, growing and stirring and developing within the corians of orange eggs deep under the gravel. The eggs are settled in safety, some singly, more in groups, all held by the protecting gravel hidden far below the reach of enemies and predators. One used to suppose that the eggs themselves were hunted and destroyed in unresisting immobility, I love that phrase, by crawling stonefly nymphs and fierce dragon nymphs, by caddises and the other creatures that live on the gravel and among the rocks of the stream beds. Intuitively that sort of makes sense, but these creatures have their life within the upper two or three inches of the stream bed and the eggs are buried deep, deeper, 12 inches or more below. It seemed once that, huddled there in the darkness through the long winter months, many would die and spread rottenness and disease among the others. But it is cleaned down in the gravel, pure water filters down, and a crust of silt forms at the surface of the gravel to make the filter screen finer still and the hidden cradles of the salmon aseptic as the operating room of a hospital. If any of you walked up the Quinsome River, for example, where there's a, a nice trail. In fact, the Hague Brown Institute has been developing uh, a, a pathway and some steps. The number of salmon that were in there spawning this last fall was absolutely astounding. And of course, the bird population was there doing all of the feeding. And you could just see uh, the connection and the web of that. And also, 
I understand that nitrogen 17 is the is a radioactive nitrogen and it's been found hundreds of miles up the inlets from the fact that um, salmon sw sw spawning bears dragging them up there eagles carrying them in and that sort of thing so it's all a nice a nice marker in, and December weather is not good for fishing weather, but I like December fishing. I do not know when the first winter steel had run to the Campbell. Some fish run, I think, in every month of the year. I caught a 16-pounder once in the canyon pool in September, and I saw another there in August lying in the sunlight in shallow water. But I go out to look for a fish as soon as the river comes to the right height in December, and the earliest I've ever found the winter run was in 1935, when I caught two fish and a kelp on November the 30th. The, the preciseness of, of Rod for this um, is the fact that he kept diaries and he kept all of these notes and so he, he knew um, what to read and how to, you know, when he was writing he looked, looked at his notes. So let's just look at um, Fisherman's Winter. And I, when I first got this book, I looked, oh, great, it's going to be all about winter, but it really isn't. Uh, it's, it's, well, it is about winter, but he really went to summer because it's all about going to um, Chile and Argentina. And so what he did was he wrote quite a technical thing about fish and the land and everything else. And uh, so this, this is the winter, but he earned it and went to the sunshine instead. So let's see, what will we touch on next? I think we'll, we'll end here, say, on the measure of the year. Uh, and it's about Canada geese, and I just, I just like this part. I mean, it's, it's a, about a two-minute read or a one-minute read. It's hard to explain the fascination of Canada geese. I do not hunt primarily to kill them, but be concerned with them. I am relieved rather than disappointed when the flock rises just beyond the range, swings wide, and passes high. I love their name, their long black necks, the clean white cheek patches, the strong and heavy bodies. They mean courage to me, devotion and wisdom, endurance and beauty, and I care not at all that the first three of these attributes should not normally be applied to creatures less than man. Interesting, not, it was not, not very anthropomorphic. I go out to see them standing among the tall grasses when they have not seen me, to find them floating serenely well out on still water and see them rise easily and powerfully from it. The measured slowness of the wing beat, the varying processional of ordered flight, the stretched necks, heads turning and watching, the voices talking, I love that call, so plainly talking among themselves, all these things are strange and beautiful, with dignity and worth of their own. In cold season, reason, it seems fantastic to consider their destruction by gunshot. Yet every emotion I feel for them is strengthened and deepened at the moment and in recollection by carrying a gun. So we'll end there on Measure of the Year.